We have just finished studying the Seventh day, old Seventh day Adventist sealing message. The sealing message dealing with the Seventh day Sabbath and the importance that it has in relationship to the sealing of the 144,000 living in these last days since 1844. So, in this particular study, I want us to go a little bit deeper to understand why did the Lord introduce Sabbath keeping? What was the purpose of the Sabbath being introduced among us? Let us turn with Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. And hallow my Sabbaths. And they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. What is the purpose of the Sabbath? The Sabbath's purpose, it was to identify us. It tells us to whom we belong. It says that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Now, Although the Sabbath was given to identify us, the Sabbath is also a sign, it says here. And hello, my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you. A sign of what? Let us take a look in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 16. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 16. And there it says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. The term here, perpetual, means everlasting. It means forever. means practically eternity. Now, the Sabbath is a sign of an eternal covenant. Now, which covenant are we talking about? Which covenant is is the eternal covenant. You know, there is the old covenant and there is the new covenant. And in my research, I have found out that there has been no one ever saved under the old covenant. It is only as people accept that the new covenant was there a plan of salvation for them. And how is that? Let us take just briefly a look at some things of the old covenant. Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. What was the problem of the old covenant? And keep in mind that the Sabbath is a sign of that new covenant. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8. We read, And all the people, and they heard what the Word of God said, and all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord had spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So he said, Everything that God says, we are going to do. Well, God was trying to educate the people to help them understand that they are not able in their own strength to do the will of God. And so what does God do? God goes to Mount Sinai. He speaks to them right from the mountain, scares them. They said, oh no, Moses, don't you have God talk to us like that anymore. You go talk to God and you tell us what God says. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 3, and Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord had said, we will do. God was trying to explain to them and help them understand the seriousness of what it means to obey His law. In verse 7 and 8, And He took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord had said, we will do and be obedient. They kept insisting, we're going to do everything that God says. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord had made with you concerning all these words. So they took that covenant. It was made into a covenant. All that the Lord had said, we will do, be obedient and do it all. They could not do it. But they could never learn that they could not do it. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua chapter 24, we find the experience at the end of the, his life. He was about to die and he wanted to just get one more time with the people. Joshua 24 verses 14 through 19. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve the Lord. 
And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You may think to yourself how important it is to make a decision. He brought all the congregation together and said, now is the time to make a decision. You must make a choice. And so they go ahead and say, okay, we're going to make a choice. Verse 16, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, He it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwell in the land. Therefore we will also serve the Lord. He is our God. Now, what would you do if you got all the people together, the whole church together, and you appealed to them to make a choice, and they came up with such an answer? Would you be happy? Well, it seems that we would, but Joshua knew the problem. And Joshua knows human nature very well. And this is why the next verse. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. In order for them to have true repentance, they have to first understand our inability to serve and obey God. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 523, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 523, we read this experience about all of this. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 523. The worship of idols was still, to some extent, secretly practiced. And Joshua endeavored now to bring them to a decision that should banish this sin from Israel. If it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord Jehovah, he said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua desired to lead them to serve God, not by compulsion, but willingly. Love to God is the very foundation of religion. To engage in His service merely from hope of reward or fear of punishment would avail nothing. Open apostasy would not be more offensive to God than hypocrisy and mere formal worship. So when they were out there being hypocrites, they were practicing idolatry secretly, and they were giving informal worship, God would have been more, less offended by open apostasy than by that. On page 524, 524, Joshua says, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Before there could be any permanent reformation, the people must be led to feel their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God. Before there could be a real change, a sincere change, they first have to understand that it is impossible for us to obey God. They had broken His law, it condemned them as transgressors, and it provides no way of escape. While they trusted in their own strength and righteousness, it was impossible for them to secure the pardon of their sins. They could not meet the claims of God's perfect law, and it was in vain that they pledged themselves to serve God. It was absolutely in vain for them to pledge themselves to serve God, because they could not do it. They must cease to rely upon their own efforts for salvation. They must trust wholly in the merits of the promised Savior if they would be accepted of God. For this reason, the Old Covenant was useless. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10 speaks about the covenant that God wanted to make with them. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. You see, the problem with a covenant made there on Mount Sinai was with the people. Verse 8 says, For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
the problem was with them. And so God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you, a new covenant in which the law will be written upon the heart. Now why is it important for the law to be written upon the heart? Let's look in Desire of Ages, page 676. Desire of Ages, page 676. When we talk about Christ and our relationship to Him, it is not enough to begin that relationship only. This union with Christ, once formed, must be maintained. Christ said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. This is no casual touch, no off and on connection. The branch becomes a part of the living vine. The communication of life, strength and fruitfulness from the root to the branch is unobstructed and constant. Separated from the vine, the branch cannot live. No more, said Jesus, can you live apart from me. The life you have received from me can be preserved only by continual communion. Without me, you cannot overcome one sin or resist one temptation. So you see, those children of Israel had to understand that there is no power in them to obey God. The Sabbath is a sign of this new covenant. And until you and I recognize that it is impossible for us to obey God in our own strength, God cannot help us and we cannot overcome one sin. In Desire of Ages, page 668, Desire of Ages, 668, it says here that all true obedience comes from the heart. You see, God wants to change the heart. The law has to be written there. If the law is not written there, God can do nothing. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify Himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to His will, that when obeying Him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Can you believe this? This is what God wants. This is the type of uh, Sabbath keeping that God wants from us. He wants a Sabbath to be a sign that there was a heart change and that all our obedience was coming right from here, willing obedience from the heart. If we agree with it, if we consent, it says here, He will so identify Himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to His will, that when we are obeying Him, we'll be doing nothing more than carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing His service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know Him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. That's what will be the result. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. You see what's going to happen? To, we will actually hate sin itself. And that's the purpose of God. God wants us to come to the point that we actually hate sin. And I have a question for you. If you hate something, is it easy to do it? Or is it hard to do it? You know, it becomes very difficult to do something we really don't want to do and we hate it. Well, sin must become that way to us. Desire of Ages, page 391. Desire of Ages, page 391. <clears throat> it is by looking constantly to Jesus with the eye of faith that we shall be strengthened. God will make the most precious revelations to His hungering, thirsting people. They will find that Christ is the personal Savior. As they feed upon His Word, they find that it is spirit and life. The Word destroys the natural earthly nature and imparts a new life in Christ Jesus. This is the covenant that God wants us to enter into. God wants us to enter into a covenant relationship with Him that He comes into our hearts and He does the destroying of sin. Without that we cannot have victory. Now, when we talk about the Sabbath being a sign of a new covenant, which part of Sabbath keeping is a continual reminder of the new covenant? Let us look at Exodus chapter 35 and verse 2. Exodus chapter 35 and verse 2. It says, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You know, the part of Sabbath that says that we should do no work, 
that we must rest. That part of the Sabbath is a sign of the new covenant. Now, how is this a sign of the new covenant? Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. And there it says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So when we say that we are to rest, and that resting is a sign of the new covenant, we'll explain why it is a sign of the new covenant. We look back at why are we to rest. It says here, because in six days God made heaven and earth and everything, and then He rested on the seventh day. Now, what did God do? Let's go back to Genesis to see exactly what God did. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. And God blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all His work which God created and made. So God, sang, He says here, He sanctified the Sabbath day. It's the same word that is translated hallowed in Exodus chapter 12. So the Sabbath here, after God had rested, He sanctified it. He hallowed that day as a day of rest. How does rest show being that it's a sign of the new covenant? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4 and verse 10. Hebrews 4. Verse 4 and verse 10. Verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So what did God do? On the seventh day, God rested from his works. Well, what does that mean for us? Verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So let us keep this in mind. When we're talking here about the Sabbath, when we are to rest on the seventh day Sabbath, it is rest from what? Rest from work. Now, why are we to rest from work? Well, number one, it says that God rested from His work. Now, to understand the Sabbath properly, it says here that we must rest from our own works. Now, who is able to rest from the, our own works? It says, He that is entered into His rest. If we have entered into God's rest, we are going to cease from our own works as He had ceased from His. Now, when we cease from our own works, it means, as in the Sabbath day, it says, we shall cease from doing our own work, right? On the seventh day. But what works is this talking about? What works are we to cease in which the seventh day ceasing of physical labor is a symbol? Because whenever we stop working our, the physical work, the temporal things on the Sabbath day, whenever we cannot do something, it is to remind us that we have ceased from our own works. Because verse 10 says, For he that is entered into his rest he also had ceased from his own works as God had from his. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 explain exactly what our own works are. Many times we're told, oh, we, we are not saved by works. That's true. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. So are we saved by works or not? According to this statement here, it's very clear, we have to cease from our own works. If we, are, we, if we are saved by grace, we cannot have these works anymore. Our own works cannot be there. But what does it mean, our own works? What are these works that we are to cease? Let's look at Galatians 5. Galatians 5 describes our own works. And these works must cease. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh. Oh, those are our works, are they not? Yeah, these are our works. Now, here's the best that we can offer up to God. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's right. Those who do these works shall do what? They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, our own works, which are these, this is the best that we have to offer unto God. We cannot give unto God any more than this. This is our best. Isaiah 64, verse 6, records it also very clearly. Isaiah 64, and verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. The best that we have to offer God, the best of our works is like filthy rags, because the best that we can offer is these works of the flesh. And it says in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because of our works, that is the best that we can offer up to God. We can give Him nothing more than that. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 10 once again. This is why it's so important for us to enter into His rest. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10 says, For he that is entered into his rest, he also had ceased from his own works, as God did cease from his. Thus, in order to keep the Sabbath, we must cease from our own works and let the Spirit produce something else. And what does the Spirit produce? Let's go to John chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. John chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. This is what God wants to have from us, not our own works. John 3, verse 5 and 6, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. You see, when we experience the new birth, we have no longer the works of the flesh. The Spirit produces something else in us. That's why they're called the fruit of the Spirit. They're not called the fruit of ourselves. We cannot offer them. So the only way that we can enter to the Sabbath rest must be that we must experience the holiness of God. Let us look at Exodus chapter 31 and verse 15. Exodus 31 and verse 15. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holiness to the Lord, if you look at the margin. What is it? It is holiness unto the Lord. It is only as we enter into this type of holiness, where the Holy Spirit takes control of our lives and produces the fruit of the Spirit in us, that we are able to enter into the Sabbath. This is why the Sabbath whenever we cease from doing our physical labor, it reminds us that we are not to do our own works, that the Holy Spirit is the work in us. Now, what is the only way that we can keep this type of true Sabbath keeping? Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So there's a promise that we should enter into this rest, but we should fear lest we, the promise being given us, we should not enter into it. We come short. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith 
in them that heard it. And the previous chapter talks about their wilderness experience. So the gospel was preached unto the children of Israel in the wilderness, but it did not profit them because they did not mingle it with faith. And so it is today in our own personal Christian experience. If we do not mingle faith in the things that we have heard, in the gospel that is preached to us, if faith is not there to lay hold of the promises of God, to lay hold of the Spirit of God's working upon us, then we are not able to do anything. We will never enter into that rest. Now why couldn't those Israelites enter into it? Let's look again. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Hebrews 3 and verse 12. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What was the problem there? There was an evil heart of unbelief. This was their problem. In verse 19 it says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief was at the root of their problem and they could not enter into His rest. Do you want to enter into His Sabbath rest? Do you want to have that experience that the sealing of God's people had? The message that you had heard on the last video was about the seal of the living God. Do you want to enter into that rest? Then it must, you must have it mingled with faith and enter into that new covenant relationship together with God. Also Hebrews 4 verses 4 through 6. Hebrews 4, verse 4 to 6. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remained that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Those who heard that message preached for the first time, they refused to enter in because of unbelief. For this reason, we find that those who truly enter into His rest, they have a life to live, but that life must be lived in a certain way. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Romans 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We as a people must learn what it means to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And what is this living by faith? Galatians 2 verse 20. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. This is why it's a rest. It, this is why this new covenant is actually a restful experience for the Christian. It is giving our heart to God, allowing Him to write that law upon our heart, and then we obey Him because of a changed heart, because we want to. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. But how did Israel come to this point of unbelief? Let us look at Hebrews chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. It says, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. What did he say? They will never enter into my rest. And you take a look at Ezekiel chapter 20. Read that whole chapter. You will see that through the whole wilderness wanderings, they kept murmuring and complaining. They did not want to keep the Sabbath. We studied earlier, they did not want to, they did not want to follow the directions that God gave to the Aaron's Rod leadership. Oh, they did not want to live on a, ve non -vegetarian, on a vegetarian diet, on a non-flesh diet. They refused everything that God gave them. They refused. And because they kept refusing... God says, you will not enter into my rest. And they never did. How did this unbelief begin? Hebrews 3, 15 through 18. Well, it is just said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? You see, when we hear a point of truth, 
when you hear truth, if you do not decide to accept that truth, then begins this whole process. It's called the hardening process. God does not want us to experience that. So rather than that, what does God want us to have? 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So God wants us to experience this type of victory. He wants to experience the victory that comes by faith, that you and I may have that overcoming experience. Instead of unbelief, to have faith in the written Word of God. Now where do we begin this work of faith? Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. Therefore we conclude that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Justification is an experience that takes place without obedience. When we first must begin, we must come to the Lord just as we are. You must come to Him right now, the way you are, with your sins, with your burdens, whatever it may be. Jesus says, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Come the way you are, and then come before Him. And once you accept the plan of God for you, then confess your sins. He will then justify you without any obedience. But that begins this wonderful process. And this is signified in the Sabbath. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15. We find here that the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, God did it in a certain way. And in the very end of the wilderness wanderings, when He repeated the law, He put this mention in it. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15, after He gives the Sabbath commandment, He says, and remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So why did God command the children of Israel to keep the Sabbath? Because He took them out of Egypt by a mighty arm. Could they leave Egypt alone? They could never have left Egypt alone. They was impossible. That was the most powerful army on earth and they were slaves. They could never leave Egypt unless God worked a miracle. Through a mighty power, God came there and delivered them out. And this is what the Sabbath is a sign of. God wants to take us out of Egypt. God wants to take us out completely, but He can only do it. We cannot do it of ourselves. The Sabbath itself points back to something to show the power that is used in order to save us. Let's look at Exodus chapter 31 and verse 17. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 17. It says, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day He rested and was refreshed. So what is the purpose of the Sabbath? It is a sign of creation. And this is why it is not enough for the Sabbath to be a sign for us of creation back 6,000 years ago. Oh no, Sabbath must be a living experience for us. If Sabbath is a sign only of something 6,000 years ago, then we don't know what we're talking about. We must have a personal experience in the Sabbath. That we must personally experience the creative power of God. This is why in Psalm 51.10 it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. It is only as God creates in us a clean heart, using still that creative power that is reminded us in the Sabbath commandment. That creative power creating us in a clean heart, only then can we keep the Sabbath and enter into His rest. If we have not experienced that creative power in the change of a heart, we are not keeping the Sabbath. We're just like the Jews, and they never kept the Sabbath. You know, many people today, they keep Saturday. But how many have entered into His rest? How many of us have experienced that creative power of God to give us that rest that we really need on the Sabbath day? For this reason, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, 
It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Or as another, other translations say, a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. God wants us to be a new creation. We can know that God is the creator of heaven and earth. We can know that He has creative power because He created us anew. Only then can we truly understand what Sabbath keeping is all about. But is it enough just to begin to walk by faith? Is it enough just to begin this journey of faith? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We're only going to receive all these blessings if we continue. It is not enough to be justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It is not enough to come to the Lord and say, Okay, Lord, take my life from now on. That is the beginning. But the Sabbath is a sign of something more than just the beginning of that creation. It says here, we must hold on the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. This is why the Sabbath is also a sign of sanctification. Let us look at Exodus 31 verse 13. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. What is the Sabbath? It is a sign that you may know. That you may know what? That you may know that it is God that sanctifies us. Yes, God begins the work and God finishes the work in us. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Leviticus 20, verses 7 and 8. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. In Philippians, it reminds me of a statement there that Apostle Paul wrote to the experience of the brethren there in Philippi. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's right, he will not only begin the work, he will finish that work in righteousness. Now, how does the Sabbath work to sanctify us? Let us go to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. Something must happen to us every single Sabbath. Nehemiah chapter 13, let us begin, let us look at verse 22. Nehemiah 13 verse 22, it says, And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. What were they to do? In order to sanctify the Sabbath day, the first thing they were to do was to cleanse themselves. Now when were they to cleanse themselves? Verse 19, Nehemiah 13, verse 19. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. Notice, when it began to be dark, these Levites were already there at the gates. But before that, they had to cleanse themselves. So as we look at the setting of the sun, as we look at the sun setting on the sixth day of the week, it is then that we are to remember that we are about to enter the Sabbath hours and we are to cleanse ourselves so that we can be ready for the Sabbath. And the reason being is because we are the priesthood. Remember 1 Peter 2 verse 9 which says that we are a holy priesthood. Also in 1 Chronicles chapter 9 verse 32, 1 Chronicles chapter 9 in verse 32, what was prepared every Sabbath day? It says, And other of their brethren of the sons of the Kohatites were over the showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. So every Sabbath they were to prepare the showbread. Now what is the bread for our day? You remember where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You remember that in John chapter 6. 
What does it mean, I am the bread of life? Let's look at John chapter 6, verse 63. John 6, verse 63, What are we to do every Sabbath day? Verse 63, It is a spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So on Friday evening as the sun is setting, we are to go through a special cleansing so that we can be ready for the Sabbath day. But on the Sabbath day, we are to have a special eating of Jesus Christ. His Word must become a part of us. This is especially on the Sabbath day. After speaking about the Sabbath in Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 he says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So God wants us to have this type of experience in regards to the Sabbath day. Also on Sabbath we must meet together. Leviticus 23 says a commandment in regards to what we should do on the Sabbath day. Leviticus 23 and verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. What is done on the Sabbath? And holy convocation. Why is the holy convocation so important? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day of approaching. What are we to be doing? We are to be exhorting one another when? Especially on the Sabbath day. We should not forsake those assemblies. And many times, sometimes people tell me, oh, I don't want to go to church anymore. Why not? Because every time I go to that church, all I hear is my sins and I'm being reproved, and I don't like going there anymore. But you know something, all I can say is praise the Lord, because we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but we are to exhort one another. Verse 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. So the purpose of our gathering together is to provoke unto love and good works. And especially if you look at the context, what does these gatherings prevent? Verse 25 and 26 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see that they are approaching. For, or because, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So the assembling together of ourselves together, especially on the Sabbath, is there to prevent us from going into the sin against the Holy Spirit. Because... We are to meet together, not to pat each other on the back, but to exhort each other. In these ways, the Lord works to sanctify us. For this reason, there is a blessing pronounced upon those who keep the Sabbath. Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 2. Isaiah 56 and verse 2. Isaiah 56. In verse 2, Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keeping his hand from doing any evil. So there's a special blessing placed upon those who keep the Sabbath day. Also, when we do this on the Sabbath day, what happens as a result? Isaiah 58 and verse 14. Isaiah 58 and verse 14 says, Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. After speaking about the restoration of the Sabbath, it says, Then you will delight thyself in the Lord. God wants us to experience that true joy that comes as a result of Sabbath keeping. For this reason, the Sabbath is called a sign. Ezekiel 20, verse 20 again. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. God wants us to know who is our God that we worship. God wants that the Sabbath is a sign. A sign of what? A sign that of sanctification, a sign of justification, a sign of the new covenant. The sign that we have ceased from our own labors, from our own works, and have entered into the works of the Spirit. For this reason, in order to keep the Sabbath day holy, we cannot keep it unless we ourselves are holy. If you, are, if you got your hands all dirty, 
and I gave you a white piece of paper to hold on to it, but tell you, do not dirty it? Is it possible? No. First, there must be a cleansing. This is why on Friday evening, before the setting of the sun, we are to also experience the cleansing. And as we come on Friday evening, and as we give our hearts to Jesus as our personal Savior, if we confess our sins before Him, what happens to our sins? Are they forgiven? Are they cleansed? 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does He cleanse us or does He not? If we confess our sins on Friday evening, if we confess them all before Him, does He forgive us? Yes, He does. And if He forgives us, does He cleanse us? Absolutely. And if He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, how much unrighteousness do we have left? None. This is why God wants us to enter into His Sabbath rest. In Desire of Ages, page 283. Desire of Ages, page 283. It says, No other institution which was committed to the Jews tended to so fully to distinguish them from surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. God designed that its observance should designate them as His worshippers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. That's right. In order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. You know where it says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. It says, again, Christ reiterated the truth that the sacrifices were in themselves of no value. They were a means and not an end. Their object was to direct men to the Savior and thus to bring them into harmony with God. It is the service of love that God values. God wants us to give Him the service of love. When this is lacking, the mere round of ceremony is an offense to Him. If we don't have this type of experience, if we have not entered into His rest, then that Sabbath keeping that we are doing is an offense to our Creator. That's why the preparation day is so important. For us to come before Him and receive that cleansing before the setting of the sun so that when we enter the Sabbath hours, we may be able to keep it holy. So it was with the Sabbath. It was designed to bring men into communion with God. But when the mind was absorbed with wearisome rites, the object of the Sabbath was thwarted. Its mere observance was a mockery. You see, the whole Sabbath keeping in the days of the Jews was a mockery to Him. And now for us, we need to enter into that rest. We need to enter into that rest that God wants to give to us. For this reason, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Some other versions say, Therefore there remaineth the keeping of the Sabbath to the people of God. And the question is to you and me today, Have you entered into His rest? Have you had this type of Sabbath keeping? If not, now is the time. You see, we read there in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now is the opportunity. Now is the time. Have you heard the voice of God speaking to you right now? Have you heard God speaking to your heart that now is the time to enter into that new covenant relationship to Him? Then my prayer is that right now you will take this opportunity to kneel down and give your heart to Jesus as your personal Savior.